Well, the sign is just behind us for the Trans Pennine Trail. One way to Broadbottom and the other way to Londondale. Guess which way we're headed. We are pretty much at the bottom of um, Bottoms Reservoir, really. Right by uh, the bottom of New Road and the turning Goddard Lane, where people sometimes park, actually, if they want to walk the reservoirs. And we're by a bit that I guess most people walk by and, and never really notice. The daffodils are just appearing in this kind of strange lone stone wall um, where at one point there was a date brick, but it appears to be missing. Um, yeah, and I'm back with Kate Rain um, and we're here to talk more things to do with mills. Uh, this time we're going to go over the other side towards Timwhistle and look down. We're going to walk towards the Longdendale Environmental Centre. Um, so you can walk with us too if you are starting. We'll just touch the date stone or the missing date stone right now. There we go. Say hello to the daffodils. And we're going to walk up Goddard Lane and there is... Um, a gate where you can walk through which gives you access to the reservoirs and you'll see in front of us the steep embankment that we're it's not too steep I suppose there's a nice slow ambling ramp that you can take which I think let's be kind to ourselves Kate we'll take the less steep option I think today yeah. it means you miss out on the view <laughs> at the top but that's all right we'll be okay today so today we're kind of looking over the other side as I call it the light side, the dark side, I haven't decided which one's uh, which yet. But Tim was told me we could see Christchurch, we can see the gauge basin, the water rushing down uh, when it comes out from um, Bottoms Reservoir. Last time we kind of painted a picture about Waterside Mill and how huge that was and the family, um, the side bottoms and how instrumental they were here, the Platt family as well. But what was happening kind of over where we're headed today. This is where some of the earliest mills were. So they would have started off as woolen mills, but then later started doing cotton spinning. Uh, The woolen industry was the main industry at that time, and the base for that was Huddersfield, which is why... When are we talking then, like early 1800s, did you say? Uh, Early 1800s, yes. And do we know, like, what was there before? Was it just farmland? Is there anything? Yeah, fields. <laughs> Lots of fields. <laughs> fields and sheep and the like. Hang on a sec, we can make a nice jumper. So wool was happening. And then what kind of caused the, the change? It was a change in Manchester. Everything starts in Manchester. Some would argue there. <laughs> so that was changing over to the cotton industry very rapidly. Mm. Uh, and it was even making its way out here uh, very early on before any mills started being built. There was a putting out system, so business owners would send out work that people would weave in their own homes on hand looms, which is why you get the weaver's cottages. I see. I mean, Tint Whistle, when I walked there with Billy the other week, is filled with tiny little weaver's cottages, and you can tell because they've got the three floors. Yes. So they'd be weaving the upstairs. Windows, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they'd be doing the work at home then, and then at what point did it kind of become a bigger deal where there started being mills cropping up here? Um, so as the industry grew in Manchester, some of the uh, owners in Manchester realised that, that there was a lot of water power out here. They kind of leapt on that and, and started uh, making their way over, over here to uh, expand their businesses. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, back then, even then, people were kind of seeing, hang on a sec, the River Etherow, we've got the valleys, there's loads of rain here. This, this could be pretty handy. It's like free resources um, it's like renewable energy of its kind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess then when the Reservoirs um, Act of Parliament passed, that was l- a bit later, so 1847, the first of four Acts of Parliament passed um, by Manchester Corporation, now we know Manchester City Council, to make a, b- make a bit of a business case, really, and say we want a piece of that, really. Um, yeah, so obviously Manchester need it needed drinking water uh, just as it, the cotton industry expanded here. It had expanded in Manchester as well, and the population had grown to <laughs> quite great levels. Yeah, and I mean, it sounded like that it wasn't a good place to be. 
in Manchester at that time. There was a lot of disease, there was a lot of cholera, people didn't have access to good, healthy drinking water. So it came to a head where something had to be done. And, you know, a lot of people don't realise that the, the reservoirs were a first of their kind. They were, you know, they'd come up with these great plans, but it took nearly 30 years to do it because there were a whole host of problems that happened along the way. Um, the mills, I mean, would it have been like kind of quite micro community? So, you know, some of the mills further down into the reservoirs, they would have had their own kind of hamlets set up with schools and, you know, just just all the inns. It, they'd be kind of on a micro level. Yeah, so it was mostly farmland around here. So when the mills were set up all the way down, down the upper row, uh, it was quite a distance just if you wanted to, a bit of bread or <laughs> to go to the pub to walk all the way into Tint Whistle. Yeah. So they did start having hundreds of people that were working there. They did start having their own communities and it was seen as small villages along the river. Yeah, I mean, these days it, it, it's kind of hard to imagine that because, you know, there's, there's this sense where there's been a bit of a sprawl. It's like, where does Glossop start and Hadfield end? <laughs> you know, there is a, there's a bridge here, which I always feel is like the clear line for where Hadfield end and Tint Whistle begins but i suppose it things have kind of changed further down the river was crowden which had the bleach works i saw a photo of that and i was hugely disappointed i thought on the map it looked like some kind of big mill but a photo it looked like a little shed i think because we've seen the end results of the biggest oh, it was bigger than <laughs> in these cotton mills uh, we forget that when the industry first started out it was just the small yeah, mill, <laughs> mill sheds yeah. um so yes yeah, some some of them are surprisingly disappointing <laughs> <laughs> um and I mean crowden had crowden hall they had a school they had the chapel across the way you know things changed when the railway came but there were other kind of things i noticed when we looked at some of the maps i mean i pinned some of them on our longdendale tales uh website map um of these tiny little mills that are mentioned in the maps around the 1840s, one of them was like, I think there's like a, a question mark around Torside Paper Mill or something like that. What do you know about that? that one? Yes, there, were, there were some small businesses around uh, Torside, or also Kidfield, as it was known, Paper Mill. Um, it began in 1804. Uh, which is when a Thomas Turner, which we haven't related to the Turner of Waterside Mills yet, um, le- leased, a, leased a, a bit of land from uh, Bernard Howard, who was later the Duke of Norfolk. And on it he built a mill which started off producing cotton cord, but then later moved to paper. So he was producing paper in that mill until 1847. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we were reading um, some letters sent by one of the railway workers who'd lived in the railway cottages just a little bit further along near Crowden Station or where Crowden Station would have been. And he'd been there since 1912. Um, and he was talking about how he couldn't understand how it would have been a, a decent paper mill because what, like the trees are rubbish around there. And he was like, how, what, what would he have used to make paper? Well, it wasn't a paper mill for all that long. I think by <laughs> by, by the late 19th century... A bit century, of money laundering going on, maybe. It was being used as a beer house. OK, see? <laughs> there and we then go. as a private residence. <laughs> and interestingly, that building does still stand. I mean, it's privately owned now. But I cycled. When I was cycling down the trail the other day, I looked and saw it there, just a way off, a little bit further up the hill. And uh, outside, anyway, it looks very similar to the some of the older pictures. I was amazed. What about some of the other mills? What else have you found? Uh, so we had a uh, Vale House that we talked about in the in last the uh, last episode. Mm-hmm. So that was that was a massive complex. But then we have two in between that and and Waterside. One of those was uh, Bottoms Mill, which was also known as Tint Whistle Mill or Paradise Mill. Uh, so this started off as a cotton mill but was sold to the Rhodes family in 1811. Well, actually, we are just at the top of the ramp now. We can see the valve houses to the left, and we can just peer over this huge stone wall, and there is the water and all the valley in front of us, with the geese, who you can hear making lovely noises. I mean, 
when I looked at the maps, um, if I turn to my right, I can see the mast on Bankswood kind of poking up in, in the distance. The roads mill was somewhere just over here. Is that correct? Is it where the reservoir is now or on the bank where the quarry is? Roads mill was up on the edge just before you get to Vale House. So in between Bottoms and Vale House Reservoir. Okay, so there's a bit where people park and it looks like at one point there was a quarry or, or something like that. And is that what you say is Paradise? Um... So it was known as Bottoms or Tint Whistle or Paradise, depending on w which time. <laughs> um, um, well, it changed, changed, these mills change names all the time. It's very, sometimes very hard to, to trace them through because they're constantly changing names as they change yeah. owners and, and businesses. Uh, so sometimes, especially when they don't exist anymore and there's no records for them, it can be very hard to chart the history through. This is going to be like what it's like when people have to do the history of uh, football arenas in the future. Yes, They won't definitely. know which, um, <laughs> which sponsor. The AO. The yeah, exactly. <laughs> but... Um, the Paradise Way, I've seen on a number of photos, people have taken photos of it and it says Paradise Way and I wondered what that was. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. So roads, um, one family, bottoms, the bottoms lodge as well. Was there anything else in Padfield at all? There was several mills in, in Padfield and, and the Rhodes family were very much involved with those. So they started off at bottoms, but obviously then it got submerged underneath the reservoir in 1867 mm. um, but by that time the grandsons were um, of Thomas Rhodes who was working this mill uh, had built up uh, their businesses quite a lot so they owned Hadfield Mill and Mersey Mills in Hadfield so it's quite a big enterprise. Mm. Herbert Rhodes who is a mayor of Glossop was also one of the donors of Victoria Hall in Glossop so so the Rhodes family gave Victoria Hall, the Platt family gave Hadfield Hall. Wow. All these mill owners, because they were making the money, they were giving back to the area. I think that's uh, interesting, isn't it? Because even, you know, with um, Edmund Potter in Dinting, you know, the fact that he wanted to um, ensure that workers got an education. So there was a reading room, um, you know, as well as churches, there were reading rooms and they could go and read and right and yeah get access to those things i suppose because i imagine the living conditions if there were so many people living in such a small area must have been quite testing and the mill owners they did want to especially around here they did want to do good for their workers they they felt like an educated and well cared for workforce would work in their favor mm, okay <laughs> well let's let's keep walking around the corner because it's pretty windy and the wind is hitting me in my face and i'm freezing I guess that people now might be starting to connect the dots in the fact that we've got Bottoms Reservoir, Vale House Reservoir, Rhodeswood <laughs> Reservoir, um, Torside Reservoir, um, Torside Paper Mill, but I guess is that a place? I mean, Torside was a little village which is now submerged into Torside. Wow, okay. Reservoir. I always wondered why that one got that name. Um, so the Rhodes, Vale House, and bottoms the the naming of the reservoirs was almost like a bit of a nod to not completely delete the history of this area yet i suppose in modern days not many of us know that there was a history or question why they have those names no i think it's, it's very easy uh, now the industry has gone to forget what huge enterprises all these things were the reservoirs they took 29 years to build and it would have been a huge undertaking. Mm. The amount of labour they were bringing in to actually build them was phenomenal, and there was little villages set up just to <laughs> just to house the workers. Yeah. So I mean, from the building of the railway line, from the building of the reservoirs, to people here working in the mill. You know, people talk about how busy traffic is and how many houses there are popping up now, but actually. It seems like back in the late 1800s, this would have been a real busy, attractive place for people to come and live and work. Yeah, so you can hear birdsong now in the rushing water, but it would have been a hive of, of industry. Almost in, like in a the, city. Yes, yeah, in the, in the 19th century. So you'd have all the building works while people were still working in the cotton mills before they were closed down. 
I mean, have you had many accounts passed to you as a trust, you know, of, through families who are still here of their grandfathers or great grandfathers? Is that the type of thing people get in touch with you or send over photos and things? So we don't actively go and things, but people do pass us information. Uh, our collection is based on the collection of both Glossop Heritage Trust and Glossop Historical Society before that. So Glossop Historical Society was started in the 1960s. They collected memories from people. People have given us stuff over the years. Together, we try and make a, a picture of, of what it would have been like in the past. Yeah, and some amazing books as well that are uh, available to talk about some of the history. I suppose one of the things that your website does, and I'm hoping some of the pins of my website will do, uh, and perhaps more from a art and cultural kind of side, is that we're trying to keep the stories of these things alive because ultimately books will get lost or thrown away and we don't want to lose the the history and the photos and you know the accounts of things of this yeah i think it's really important that we know about our past and and the communities that lived here before and it's really important to tell their stories uh, and i think it really helps to make a connection to the area to the place that you live not just for people that are here but for people that may have moved away <laughs> and they want to reconnect with with places they've been before. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I had only ever really heard about the mills of Glossop, the usual ones that everyone hears about, but I mean, it's been really interesting to hear from you about what actually happens around here. And we're just reaching the, the top of the hill now where we can see uh, the Londondale Environmental Centre. Sun's just about coming out through the gaps in the rhododendrons. Uh, it's a little bit less windy and a bit warmer here. Kate, I've got to say thank you because you've been really instrumental in um, a lot of the research that I've done for this project and even just finding like the old articles of the Glossop Chronicle, which we know dates back to 1859. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the stuff that you found there, which I would definitely recommend people to go and read some of those articles from everything to do with the Longdondale lights to, gosh, I mean, football fans having a, having a Barney and Tint Whistle because they're uh, Liverpool fans and they lost. I mean, the, the, the stuff that you've got is brilliant. And uh, if people are looking to find out stuff from the local history to maybe get in touch. Thanks for doing what you do. And on a voluntary basis, you know, to you and the team, it's just incredible. We need people like you. <laughs> Keep going. Thank you very much. And if anyone does have any stories or memories they would like to share, we'd be very happy to hear them. Perfect. All right, well, we will go and get warm and... Uh, We'll go uh, ponder and wonder what would the roads be doing now? What would the bottoms be doing? Where would they be living? What would they be wearing? What would they be having for tea tonight? I'll leave those kind of memories in your mind and uh, yeah, go and explore some of the archive and the photos. See you again.